So let's read from John chapter 18, specifically verses 36 through 38 from the New King James Version. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Verse 37, Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Verse 38, Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for... Holy Spirit, you being here tonight already and ministering to the hearts and lives of your people, cause your word to become alive in us and to change us, Lord, and we give you thanks and praise in your name. Amen. You may be seated tonight. I want to say thanks to Pastor Daniel for allowing me the great privilege to stand before you tonight and to preach the word. There's been some powerful messages that have come forth well, actually, for as long as I can remember, there's been powerful messages that have come forth from this pulpit, but especially and specifically in the last few weeks, I've got some of Pastor Daniel's notes. He preached a powerful message on life uh, in relation to what's going on in our world today. He preached a powerful message on raise the standard, calling the church to do what we're supposed to do and allow the Holy Spirit to raise a standard in us. Holy Spirit's been speaking to Pastor Daniel with directives to declare the Word of God and what it says about major issues that are going on in our world. Our world is in chaos. Was oh, it going to be one of those messages tonight? No, not necessarily. But I am speaking a reality and a truth. Our world is in chaos. But I'm also here to declare another truth. Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace, is still peace in the midst of the chaos going on around us. Amen? Jesus is the one who spoke to the storm and said in Mark 4, 39, peace be still. Jesus is the one who said in John 16, 33, in me you may have peace. Jesus is the one in John 14, 27 who says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. In the midst of the chaos that is going on all around us, in a world that seems to be turned upside down, in fact, the Bible talked about the times that we live in when evil is called good and good is called evil. Man, that's a chaotic situation. And in the midst of the chaos that we're living in today and tonight, I'm here to tell you, Jesus is the Prince of Peace in the midst of that chaos. And for those of us, like those that are gathered here tonight and those that are online, that that we know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. He is our perfect peace. And he will give our minds perfect peace if we will keep our hearts and minds focused on him in the midst of chaos. What I'm trying to say tonight, church, is no matter how crazy the world is getting, it still needs Jesus. He's still the answer. And you and I are still the ones that are called to carry the message of Jesus to this world of chaos. Can somebody say amen? I don't know about you, but my heart was grieved to hear the latest tragedy that's taken place, the shooting in Texas. We prayed this morning in early morning prayer, and I was, I was just really having a tough time getting through praying for that because it's senseless. There's, 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 no, there's no call. There's no reason. There's no rhyme. There's, there's nothing about it that makes sense, and yet it happens, and it happens now more seemingly than ever before because our world is in chaos. And so I felt directed tonight by Holy Spirit to bring to you what I believe and what I hope will be an encouraging but also a thought-provoking message from God's Word from a very interesting passage of Scripture, the text that we read tonight. See, if you know the setting of that story, in, in many ways the political climate that was going on at the time that the Gospel of John as he recorded these events, the political, political climate then is pretty similar to the political climate now. 
God had sent his son Jesus, Emmanuel, God who is with us, Jesus. His name will be called Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. God had sent Jesus into the world to reach first and foremost the lost house of Israel. And Israel was being uh, held under the oppression of, of the Roman Empire and Roman rule. And Israel and the Jewish people were crying out for a deliverer. They were looking for somebody to come and overthrow Rome and set everything right and stop the chaos. Because let's talk about the Roman Empire for just a moment. This is history lesson tonight, if you will. What was taking place in the Roman Empire? Idol worship, worship of anything but God. I was listening, I, 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 my, my playlist on my Spotify is rather, rather varied and broad, uh, but a lot of times I like to focus on uh, late 80s, early 90s Christian music, because I was a teenager and I was in high school and I graduated in 1982. Yes, I'm that old. Uh, I graduated from high school in 1982. And so there was a lot of Christian music that, that I, I was into. And, and there was one particular song that came across my Spotify playlist the other day. And it says, if there, the, one of the lyrics, uh, is, the title of the song is Let It Go. And one of the lyrics says, if there is only one God, why do we serve so many? If there's only one truth, why do we act like there's not any? And it started sparking something and the Holy Spirit began to take that. And, and because the, the Roman culture and the Roman rule of, of, of including Israel and the world at that time was one of, of idol worship, worshiping anything, including Caesar. Caesar was a God. You worship Caesar. You worship this God. You worship that God. Gods of stone and, and wood and ivory and, and marble. And, and there was child sacrifice. There was human sacrifice. There was human trafficking. There was political corruption, there was murder, there was greed, there was lust, there was chaos in the world in which this setting for this passage of scripture was taking place. And God had sent his son Jesus into the midst of that to be the light in the, of the world, to be light in the midst of the darkness. And now all of a sudden, the very people that he had been sent to, the Jewish people, didn't like how he was doing things because they had a different idea. They had a different opinion about how things should be done. And many of them couldn't see that Jesus was actually the Messiah they were looking for so they had him arrested but it's interesting and I'm just trying to set the background before I give you the, the the main thing that I felt like the Holy Spirit gave me to share tonight it's interesting that when they arrested Jesus if you study out the trial even even the trial of Jesus the arrest of Jesus the accusations against Jesus they were all illegal by both Jewish culture and by Roman law but they didn't care they wanted to get rid of the voice of truth that was declaring the truth, the one who declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. They wanted to get rid of Jesus, and they, the Jewish people who hated the Roman culture was willing to use the Roman culture to silence the voice of truth. And that's the background in which this text that I felt like the Holy Spirit gave me to share with you tonight, that's the background and the setting for it. A time of political chaos, a time of political corruption, a time when the world needed a savior, kind of sounds like the headlines today. Our world needs Jesus. But it's interesting that when Jesus was brought before Pilate and Pilate was having this discussion, he asked this question, what is truth? Now, Merriam-Webster Dictionary states this about truth. I skipped the one that says the state of something being true. I cannot stand the definitions when they give that. Okay, so I went a little deeper. This is what it says. The body of real things, events, and facts. The state of being the case or a fact is the definition of Merriam-Webster. But are you aware that in our culture today, there are four classifications of or types of truth? If you didn't know, I'll give them to you real quick because I don't want to focus on them because I have a problem with them. The first one is objective truth. I don't really have a problem with that because it says that what exists and can be proven is truth. Well, I agree with that. You can, you can prove that the sun shines because we see it. You can prove that the grass grows because we see it. That's truth. The second truth, though, is normative truth. What a group agrees is true. Yeah. The next one is subjective truth. How a person sees or experiences the world. 
And the fourth listed tr category of truth is called complex truth. And you know what that one does? That recognizes the validity of all three of the others and allows for someone to focus on the one that is most useful at any given time. What a cop-out. What a cop-out. It's like whatever is truth for you, that works for you. It might not be truth for me. It's, it's objective because so it might be objective because we might be able to prove it, but we might not be able to prove it, but you belong to a group of people that believe that and agree together. So that's the normative truth for you. And, and, and so, so we're just going to say complex. It's just a complex thing. Whatever truth means to you in the moment, however it fits. And what that does is that makes it truth can be shifting and changing and moving and, and never being the same. Because you know what? That's what the world says there are four types of truth, but they left out the most important one, and that's eternal truth that is represented in the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. He not only represents and says the truth, He is the truth. He declares that, and the Word of God declares that He is the truth. And you know what? It doesn't matter whether people believe the eternal truth or not. That, doesn't, that isn't what makes it truth. What makes it truth is it has stood the test of time. Heaven and earth may pass away, but my Word will endure forever. Uh, we, we, we have a faith in something that is real. It's the truth. He is the truth. I got ahead of myself a little bit, but that's okay. I believe that this question that Pilate asked is one of the most important questions in Scripture because it's the same question our world is wrestling with today, right now. What is truth? By the way, in our, our text that we read, the answer to Pilate's question was standing right in front of him. Jesus had already declared, I'm here to declare the truth because I am the truth and everyone that, that is of the truth hears and knows my voice and recognizes me. And Pilate says, well, what is truth? Pilate totally missed that truth was standing in the person of Jesus right in front of him. But we'll get to more of that in a moment. So what is truth? Where do we find truth? Where can we go in this chaotic world to find the source for real truth? I offer to you tonight, church, that we go to the spirit of truth to find the truth. John 16, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. The Holy Spirit guides us into the truth, but guess what? It's up to you and I to accept his truth. Unfortunately, today in the world that we live in, many will turn a blind eye to the truth when it doesn't suit their purposes or when it hinders them from doing things, those things that are pleasing to their flesh and not to the spirit man. Because see, I'm not just talking about the world. I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm bringing it home. The Holy Spirit will lead and guide you and I into all truth. But we have to be willing to accept his truth. We have to be willing to accept what he has to say. See, Sometimes we get conviction and condemnation mixed up. You may have heard me share this before, but I feel like the Holy Spirit says share it again. Condemnation doesn't come from God, and it doesn't come from the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I didn't come into this world. John chapter 3, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world. The world is already condemned because they don't believe in me. I came to save the world. So when you hear a voice speaking to you, telling you as a believer... Actually, as anybody, believer or non-believer, but especially tonight, for those in the house, as a believer, you hear a voice that's telling you you're worthless, telling you that you don't matter, telling you you ought to quit, telling you why are you even trying, saying, you look at that, you just look at those thoughts you're dealing with, look at those things you're saying, that man, God, how can you say you're a Christian when you just did that? That's not God. That's not the voice of the Holy Spirit. That's the voice of the enemy speaking through your flesh to try to get you held in condemnation so you're not willing to hear the truth of what the Word of God would say because the Holy Spirit is the one, amen? The Holy Spirit is the one that brings conviction lovingly. Sometimes lovingly is forceful, but it's still lovingly. Sometimes he, comes, he, sometimes he gets up in your grill because he loves you. It says, hey, 
don't do that. Hey, that's not who you are. Hey, that's not the way you're supposed to live. You know better than that. My, my word that you've hidden in your heart that you won't sin. You know that what you're thinking, what you're planning, what you just did, what you're about to do, that thought that you're dealing with that you didn't pull down. Because the Bible says take every thought captive that tries to exalt itself against what? The knowledge of Christ. What is the knowledge of Christ? Truth. So the Holy Spirit comes and says, hold on, let's compare what you're thinking to the truth. And if it doesn't line up, get rid of it, cast it down. So we need to understand that we need to allow the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, to lead us into all truth and it will never contradict the word of God. Well, I think the Holy Spirit's telling me I need to divorce that sorry man that I'm married to. I, the Holy Spirit's telling me I need to divorce that really nitpicky woman and go marry this uh, other person that I saw at church. Can I tell you that is not the whole voice of the Holy Spirit, because that doesn't line up with the Word of God. Well, I think the Holy Spirit's telling me to just sell everything and, and just, just trust Him. Well, maybe He will, but He's going to confirm it through His Word. The Holy Spirit's never going to tell you and I to do something that's contrary to the Word of God, but the Holy Spirit will confirm the Word of God because He will lead and guide us into all truth, and He will remind us of everything Jesus taught us, and, he, and that's what it says in the Word of God. But we have to not turn a blind eye. I've actually talked to people before that I'm like, well, what about this? Well, yeah, I'm, God and I aren't talking about that part right now. Doesn't really quite work that way. Okay? Well, yeah, I, I, I know, and, and I'll get to that later. Well, later may not come. Or you might end up being further down the road and farther away from God than you thought you wanted to be. All right, I'm, I'm meddling, so I'll keep going. John 14, 16 through 17 says, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, in whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The world has gotten into a position that they no longer see the truth, but they are blinded by political parties, wealth, position, greed, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, which the Bible talks about as well. 1 John 2.16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. This question that Pilate asked in this text that the Holy Spirit directed me to is one of the most profound questions ever asked. What is truth? So I want to ask you tonight. What is truth to you? Is what the doctor told you truth? Now, I'm not down on doctors. I'm married to someone in the medical field. And can I t remind you again? There's never been a cure that's been, re that's been discovered and, and has been effective in curing diseases that the enemy released. The enemy never showed some scientist or some doctor, some person in the medical field, how to cure polio. God did. So God's not anti-doctor. He's not anti the medical field. In fact, there are good, godly, God-fearing, God-loving, God-honoring doctors and nurses around this world and around this nation, right here in our own state, right here in our own hospitals, that love God. But is what the doctor says, is that absolute truth for you and I? Is truth what your family has told you? Is truth what you've read in books? Now, I'm a reader. Wasn't always a reader. In high school, couldn't stand to read. Why do I have to read that? Where are the cliff notes? Somebody find me some cliff notes for this book. Okay? War and Peace? Oh, my. About that thick? My goodness. No way. But I'm a reader now because I, I appreciate gaining knowledge and understanding about things. But do I base my truth on the things I read in books? What is truth? That's a question we all must faith, face. How can I know the truth? Well, it's found in the person of Jesus Christ. And it's found in great many, great many stories from Scripture that show us the truth of who Jesus is. Acts chapter 3 is one of them. It contains a story that has some truths in it. Now, all of God's Word is true, but specifically for my illustration, this story has some truths in it. And it's the story of a man who discovered a truth that he'd been looking for for a long time. See, in Acts chapter 3, there was a man who 
the truth was, the normative truth, it could be proven, he couldn't walk. He was lame from birth. He couldn't get around without somebody helping him. And the Bible says every day of his life, since birth, when he was old enough to want to go to the temple, he was taken and laid at the gate, beautiful, at, near the temple, to beg alms of people. That was a truth. That was a normative truth. Couldn't be denied. This is the guy. This is the guy we've seen every day. He was unable to walk. Peter and John in Acts chapter 3 were going into the temple to worship. And the man, was, the man who was living the truth of his disability was exposed to a truth that was greater than his disability. And that truth was Jesus. And when he was exposed to the truth of Jesus and the power of Jesus and the power of Holy Spirit working through those who dared to believe the truth, he was totally healed. Silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, I give to you. And listen, it says, and lifting him up. See, the Holy Spirit will reveal truth to us. We have to respond to it. It's one thing for the Holy Spirit to reveal truth to us that he will heal. It's another thing for you and I to step out in faith and make a declaration and then begin to call people to action of the declaration of faith that we've made. And that's what Peter and John did. They called the man to action. Silver and gold I don't have, but what I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. And man, they were picking him up. They had to have faith. They had to know. They had to be plugged into the truth. The truth, the spirit of truth flowing in them. Otherwise, they were going to lift the man up. And when they let go of his hand, he was going to fall back down. But he didn't. It says instantly as they lifted him up, his ankle bones and the joints got strength. And he went walking and leaping and dancing and rejoicing into the temple. Because of the truth that trumped the truth of his life. See, there's a truth that will trump the truth of your life. I, I, I'm not, the reality of where you are at is your reality. But I'm here to tell you there's a greater truth than any reality we can experience here, and his name is Jesus. And he wants to become very present and active in our lives tonight. Here's some things that the Word of God says uh, about itself when it comes to these uh, this concept of truth. Psalm 119, verse 142, your justice is eternal and your law is perfectly true. Psalm 119, 151, but you are near, O Lord, and all your commands are true. On the basis that God is true and every man is a liar, what is truth? Well, Jesus declared, he said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Pilate asks the question, what is truth? And truth was standing right in front of him. And tonight I wanted you to consider, maybe for the first time or in a more magnified way in your life, the truth that is standing with open arms before you. And his name is Jesus. Jesus did not say that he would show us the truth. He said, I am the truth. The fact of the matter is Jesus is truth personified. He is the truth. And because he is, then we need to find out what his truth says about the situations that we're in tonight. Just like that, that man who was lame, the lame beggar. He needed the truth of Jesus to be pushed into or overtake the truth of the situation he was in. And maybe that's where you are tonight. Jesus, Jesus said in John 6, 35 through 40, I'm going to give you lots of scripture. He replied, I am the bread of life. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry again. Those who believe in me will never thirst. So are you finding things in your life right now that you don't seem to find satisfaction in? There's a longing. There's something that seems to be missing. Can I tell you, Jesus said, no one who comes to me will ever be unsatisfied again no matter what the need is. John 10.10 10 says the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give you life in all its fullness. This is the truth tonight. See, you might be saying tonight, I can't do anything for God because of my past failures. I can't do anything for God because of the things that I've done wrong. Can I tell you, Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So which truth are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the truth that is clouding your mind that says that you're unable to do anything for God because of the mistakes of your past? Listen, the mistakes of your past do not define your future. If you surrender your past to the 
Lord and allow him to deal with your past by washing it clean, casting it into the sea of forgetfulness as far as the east is from the west, never to be. Do you know that scripture says that? He will cast our sins, our transgressions, as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered again. That's the truth. So if some little voice, your own voice, the voice of your own mind is saying, yeah, but you know, God, I don't know if you can, I don't know if I'm truly forgiven. I still struggle with that. Listen, the struggle is not the issue. It's what you do when you start struggling in that. The Bible's full of examples of godly people, people that God used to do miracles, people that God used to storm uh, the enemy's gates, people that God used to raise the dead, people that God used to preach the gospel, people that God used to plant churches and to preach and proclaim the gospel, people that God used in a variety of different ways that still struggled with stuff. Paul said, I I see this war raging in my members. The things that I don't want to do, I find myself doing. And the things that I know I ought to be doing, I find myself not doing. Then he said, oh, wretched man that I am. But Paul was the one that declared, those that do, that mind the things of the Spirit, walk after the Spirit. He's saying we can make a choice when the Holy Spirit reveals truth to you and I, church. We can make up a, our mind to follow his truth. And I've got to tell you tonight, that's what this world needs. This world is in confusion. This world is in chaos. There are neighbors. There are co-workers. There are people in leadership and people that are begging on the street. They're lost and confused and searching for the truth and they're looking in all the wrong places and all the while this Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth is saying to His church, will you not stand up for the truth and allow me to reveal truth to you and allow you to be truth carriers and truth bearers to this world so those that are hungry and thirsty can be filled, can be saved, can be delivered, can be set free. It is possible, church. Not only is it possible, it's what God expects from you and I. You know, Jesus told his followers, and that's all of us, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. But he said, start first where you are, in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then to the other parts of the earth. Where's your Jerusalem? It's right outside there. It's Fred Meyer. It's cars. It's Walmart. It's Miller's, Little Miller's Market, or, uh, Little Miller's Ice Cream Place right across the street. It's the school your kids go to. It's, listen. I'm not saying if God's not directing you to pull your children out of public school because of the chaos that's there, that you shouldn't do that. But what happens if all the believers pull their kids out of the Christian school and all the Christian teachers and all the Christian uh, administrators and all the people that carry the Spirit of God, what happens if they jump ship and form some little thing over here? And listen, I, we need a school. Don't get me wrong. I taught at Wasilla Lake Christian School before it closed down. I'm not saying we don't need it, but I'm saying for some of us, for some of you, God's saying, oh, won't you trust me to be full of the Holy Spirit, full of my Spirit right where you are and don't give the world don't give our Jerusalem don't give our community over to the enemy but let's stand for the truth let's raise a standard let's let the Holy Spirit move through us and cause there to be a revival in the marketplace on the schools on the campuses amen what is truth Jesus what does the world need Jesus who do we have Jesus. What are we supposed to do? Give them Jesus. Maybe tonight you're dealing with something that is saying to you, I'm not worth anything to God. Can I tell you Romans 5, 8 says, this is how we know God loves us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's how much you're worth to God. When you had nothing to give to him, when there was nothing about your life that was worth anything to God, your life was steeped in sin. 
Well, I got saved when I was four years old. How much sin could I have? You still had a sin nature. And you still needed Jesus to become your Lord and Savior. And that's how we know how much we're worth to God. Maybe something, maybe you're thinking this world is nuts and we're in trouble. Well, Jesus declared in John 16, in this world, you will have trouble. But guess what? Be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. That means we win. That means that the world needs to start learning how to deal with us instead of us as the believers trying to figure out how to deal with them. We're the ones with the answer. We're the ones with the truth. We're the ones that carry the truth. If we're willing to allow the spirit of truth to speak to us and to lead us and guide us into all truth and then do what he says. We had leadership training today, staff leadership training today. Pastor Josh Morocco, and if I, if I, I, hope, I hope I don't get in trouble for saying this. But he said it, so I'm going to. Pastor Josh Morocco was saying, man, we need Holy Spirit-filled services. We need people speaking in tongues. We need people praying in their prayer language. We need a concert of prayer. But what good is it if, when, if we're doing that, but we're not obeying what the Holy Spirit is telling us to do? Something's wrong. Ouch. That one hit me. Why, you haven't been obeying what the Holy Spirit says? Listen, I, you, you, I love what pastor says and I do it. You need to do it too. I just need to do a check. Holy Spirit, have I missed something? Holy Spirit, have I, have I neglected something? Holy Spirit, have I not been paying attention? Have I not been listening? Have I, have I missed what you've been telling me? And if so, please forgive me, Holy Spirit, because you're the spirit of truth. And I don't want anything but the truth, the real truth. I don't want subjective truth. I don't want nor, uh, uh, you know, truth that says, hey, well, that's just, that's just what y'all believe, but it's okay. I want the truth. The eternal truth, which is Jesus Christ and the spirit of truth living inside of me. Maybe you're like, man, I'm just, my life is dark. I'm living in darkness. Can I tell you, Jesus said he is the light of the world. John chapter 8, verse 12. Maybe you're feeling like, man, I'm just lost. John, we already read it. Jesus said in John 14, 16, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You're thirsty for spiritual things, and it doesn't seem to be finding any satisfaction. John, Jesus said in John 7, 37 and 38, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Of this he spoke of the Holy Spirit, which they had not yet received. Jesus is the truth. He's our shepherd. He's the word of God. He's our teacher. He's our healer. He's our savior. He's the bread of life. He's the vine. He's the door. He's the servant of all. He's the Alpha and Omega. He's the bridegroom. He's Emmanuel, God with us. He's the best counselor in the world. He's our, etern our, he's our attorney. And he's our wisdom. Minister Micah, if you're close, can you come back to the keys? No matter what your question is tonight, Jesus is the truth, and he's the answer to that. He is the truth. Here's a great truth for you and I tonight. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1. But now, thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Oh, if you don't get any other truth statement tonight, get that one. Put that one to memory, Isaiah 43, 1. So that when the world says, who are you to believe in Jesus? You say, hey, I am his, he has called me by name. Before, the one who formed me, the one who created me, he has called me by my name and I am his. What is truth? It's not a what, it's a who. And his name is Jesus. He's the truth. Do you believe that tonight? Thanks for listening to this message today. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you realize that you need Jesus as your Savior and you'd like to pray with me to either commit your life to Jesus for the first time or rededicate your life to the Lord, repeat this prayer after me. Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for my sins. Jesus, thank you for dying for me and bringing me forgiveness. I'm sorry for my sins 
I repent of them today, and I ask you to cleanse me and wash me of all my sin. I commit to live for you all the rest of the days of my life, and I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today, would you text the word SAVED to 907-357-2065? We'd like to send you some information and some materials that will help you in your Christian walk. God bless.